Good morning, and thank you so much for being with us. It's great to see a room that is um, packed and buzzing. It's terrific. Um, we're really grateful for you being here. Uh, my name is Christian. I run the Centre for Social Justice, and uh, we uh, have an exciting hour or so lined up um, today. Just before I start, um, for those who use Twitter, uh, which I guess is most of us, um, I would suggest a hashtag, which um, I guess you will understand. Really. Hashtag of uh, Break to Britain. If you're wanting to tweet about today, um, it'd be good to have you doing that. And if you want to tag the CSJ, our address is at CSJ Think Tank. Um, I, so, a yeah, huge welcome to this morning's event. Today really marks a very important moment for the centre as we launch our new programme of work, which will take us between now. Um, and the next 18 months on a really important journey. So I want to start by saying a few thank yous. Uh, firstly, I want to um, thank our sponsors who are listed up there. And um, uh, We're really extremely grateful for your generosity, your expertise, your time, and your interest in this work. And because of what you've given to us, we can get on with the important things that we've set ourselves by way of a challenge. I also really want to thank our working group members and our chairman. The CSJ is built on the time which is given voluntarily by some brilliant people. So I really want to thank all of you, Alfred, Debbie, Chris, Noreen, Danny, and uh, Sir Robin uh, Bosch, who's not here this morning, um, but he will be leading our work on education. So a big uh, warm welcome and thank you. I will speak for about 10 minutes by way of introduction. Uh, you may have heard there's a report out today about media standards um, uh, by someone called Levson. Um, we only found that out because we hacked a few mobiles. Um, but it's coming out today. Um, our, yesterday I got a call from Oliver Levin's office saying um, that he'd just been appointed by the Prime Minister to oversee the work um, the government was putting together on responding to Levson. We tried to move things around, um, but uh, really frustratingly he has been called to a emergency cabinet meeting this morning. Um, and has written uh, a statement of endorsement about the project and I brought out some things that he would have said um, today which I'll, you know, I'll read a few paragraphs of it. I'm really sorry he's not with us, he's disappointed but um, uh, unfortunately this, we've had a bit of uh, bad luck with, with Levinson coming out today um, which is one of those things. So I'll um, speak, then we'll have about five minutes from each chairman and they will in a sense pitch um, for what we're about to start, and we really want it to be an invitation as well for all of you to come and work with us over the next 18 months. Then we'll take questions and any feedback. But first, a few words about the CSJ. It was established, I think, for one very simple purpose, and that was to find and promote solutions to some of the deepest social problems in the UK. Uh, it was in response to uh, a growing number of communities that seem to be drifting away from the mainstream in society. And in a sense, Britain was coming apart. If you look at certain areas, we were shocked and angered by the lives um, that people were having to live in these communities. So we responded to that national challenge, and it was set up by Ian Duncan Smith, who um, obviously got to the issue of the Conservative Party, but as he had travelled to the inner cities and to the communities that seemed so far from the world of Westminster and from national politics, he realised that he wanted an independent organisation that could stand up and listen to those communities and challenge the entirety of Westminster uh, and, and to bring some of that reality to the political debate. Because during a period of record economic growth that we had from, I think, 1992, we had 63 consecutive quarters of economic growth and employment rising, prosperity rising. We also had some strange things going on. So we had a benefits and welfare bill that was skyrocketing. It went up between 40 and 60 percent during that period. Two million children growing up in households where there wasn't work, and a strange benefit system that told people not to bother working, even if they wanted to work. Of course, most people want to work want that chance to get on um, and get up in, in life, but the benefit system wasn't on their side. We saw family breakdown higher than at any other level and at a point in, in recent history. 
About 60,000 pupils a day truanting from school. Debt strangling families. And UK personal debt topping 1.3 trillion pounds. Drug treatment that wasn't getting people off drugs. A lack of alcohol treatment that was, um, was, was failing to. Crime, reoffending, street gang involvement. These things were creating, um, if you like, a perfect storm in certain areas that people just couldn't escape from. And in, in, in some communities that we, we saw and we go to, life expectancy is as low as 54 years old, and, which is incredible. But then you travel two, three, four miles down the road, and life expectancy is 75, 80, 82 years. And so there are these sort of areas that are cut off, and that is what motivated the CSJ. And those areas, I think, are areas we recognise because we've done some um, polling with YouGov in the last few days, and the results that have come back are fascinating. Over half of the British people public, um, recognise that kind of area in their local community that is suffering from broken families, high crime and poor schools, and ultimately in those areas are people. And people are what motivate us at the CSJ. We've never claimed that Britain is full of um, people struggling with social problems or that these social problems we identify are the only causes of poverty. We've never said that. But we do see far too many people facing a life um, and a set of opportunities that they should not be facing in a, in a society as modern well, as relatively prosperous as ours. We know lots of people like Rob, who one of our team met um, recently. Rob grew up in a chaotic home. He had a father who um, was brutal and spent most of Rob's childhood in prison. And his mother was a drug addict and had severe mental health difficulties. And he used to skip school as a young boy to look after his mother because there was no one else really around who could look out for her and help her through the day. But one day, she committed suicide and uh, it was Rob that found her. He then spent a lot of his um, teenage years living with his auntie or in and out of care homes and, and foster placements. And he got into petty crime, substance abuse, and was really on a life trajectory that we see so much of the CS. Jay. Or people like Gilbert. I met Gilbert about two years ago. He's in his 80s. Um, he is going uh, blind. He lives on his own in a damp, dilapidated house in the middle of nowhere. He doesn't call up for any means tested benefits because he's just above the threshold. He has no immediate family, no immediate community. He sees hardly anyone week to week. People like Gilbert, who are trapped behind their front door, they're slowly shutting down because of this sort of loneliness and isolation that comes to too many people in older age. And it's people like Rob, people like Gilbert, who we come across and we're moved to um, find a way through for. So our mission is to transform those communities and change the life chances we give to people living in them. But there's also so much cause for optimism. Um, I just told you about Rob. Well, Rob was picked up by one of the most phenomenal voluntary sector organisations in his teens. And after a lot of work with him, he got onto an apprenticeship course for um, mechanics and has now been given a chance and is doing the most incredible job um, in terms of mechanics. And actually, he spent a lot of time in Kenya, raised money um, for Kenya, set up a similar scheme in Kenya, and now lots of young guys in Kenya are going through that um, course. And there are all sorts of stories of that life transformation. We're not really about pointing a finger of doom and gloom. Um, we're all about revealing the nature of the challenge, but then finding the solutions that really make a difference to people like Rob or people like Gilbert. We're really proud to be independent as an organization, and we're wanting to develop a cross-party consensus on poverty where you can find it because for too long that has not been the case. We've got a unique model at the CSJ, which is of course relevant today, and you'll see it today. Um, we give our development of policy over to people who know so much more about it and know more about the topics than, than our researchers and, and people like me. So we appoint, um, if you like, committees of people who give their time voluntarily to the CSJ and they're led by chairmen like the ones we'll hear from in a minute. Um, and they go all over the country. So with Breakthrough Britain, the original Breakthrough Britain report, we uh, spent 3,000 hours overall, all across the country, listening 
to people in more than 2,000 organizations. We polled 50,000 people who went abroad to see which countries were doing things better than we were. We tell it as we see it, based on that forensic audit across the country. And so our model enables us to be a bridge between Westminster, this bubble that we're in today, and the real world. And for too long that bridge hasn't been there. So today marks the beginning of our second Breakthrough Britain report. The first one was important because it shook up a debate about poverty, a debate that had become quite tired, quite narrow, and a left-wing, right-wing approach to poverty that ended up with too much bickering and not enough action. Breakthrough Britain 1 established what we call pathways to poverty, and those pathways we set out um, as, as five things that you have to reverse politically with decisions made here if you want to break the back of it. Poverty. So what were those pathways to poverty? We found family breakdown. Uh, we found educational failure. We found a welfare system that did not encourage people to get back to work and wasn't on the side of people who wanted to take the work opportunity. We found severe levels of personal debt that were breaking down families and making it very difficult for people to get on. And we found drug and alcohol abuse and um, addiction that was so prevalent in some of these areas that we'll be familiar with. And those five things became the basis on which we set a challenge to the political community and we said, these are the things you must start with. And um, the exciting thing about Breakthrough Britain, obviously, was that we also identified a sick volume. And that was all about the role of the charitable sector and the voluntary organisations. Because when we go to these communities where there wasn't a huge amount of, um, of government engagement, we met um, people who hadn't seen a police officer for years because the police officers didn't want to go to the areas that they were, to be honest, most needed. And we found social workers struggling under the burden of things that they couldn't do. We found these charities, charities that were doing the most phenomenal work transforming people's lives. And so the sixth volume of Breakthrough Britain and the sixth volume of what we're launching today is all about the charitable sector and what we can do to unlock the potential of these charities and these organisations. And of course, Breakthrough Britain had an impact politically and in terms of policy. So a number of the things that um, this government is doing were sparked by Breakthrough Britain and what came of it. So universal credit and the welfare reforms came from um, the work we did earlier in Breakthrough Britain. Some of the education reforms, um, we played a part in terms of setting a debate about free schools and leadership for head teachers in schools and pupil premium. We set a new direction for drug treatment. And although we'll hear there are some major challenges yet to come, the idea that people are now talking about full recovery um, is a mark of some of the progress that Breakthrough Britain generated. And there are other things too. So it was important and it made a difference. Why bother again? Well, that's the, that's the question you may be thinking about. Well, we feel that there are new challenges across this nation. Um, we feel that there's a new political climate that the Centre for Social Justice is to speak into. We feel that there's a new economic reality, of course, more importantly, that public policy makers have to deal with. So we want to translate what needs to happen to, to, to completely um, change these areas into a, into a set of ideas that are radical, but they are relevant to the political community. We will set out now in the next 18 months to find the big ideas, um, and we will also be making arguments for the older ones that yet haven't been won. We will engage cross-party in this process. We are working with the Labour Party as closely as we can. We're working with the Conservative Party as closely as we can, and with the Liberal Democrats too, because this is about something much bigger than the parliamentary knockabout and the political cycles that come and go. This work has to stand the test of time, and it has to be as relevant if Ed Miliband becomes Prime Minister as it is if David Cameron wins again in 2015, or indeed if we have a coalition government of a mixture of different parties. This is about setting a social justice agenda the next parliament, um, and we know there's a huge amount of political interest in it. We had the Prime Minister a few weeks ago who said he was um, very keen on what we were um, publishing and would be all ears. We have Oliver Levin, and I'll come on to that in a second, saying the government is ready and waiting for our ideas. We've had Labour politicians like David Lammy, John Crudders coming in a few weeks, who are again all ears. Uh, this is a big opportunity for us, and we will take it to the best of our ability, but through all of the process, keep in mind people we were established to serve and to help. And that is the whole point of this process. What would make a difference in the lives of people?
people and communities that are cut and hot and cut adrift. I want to just read a couple things from all of that, and then I'm going to hand over straight to each of the chairmen. And as I say, Oliver was disappointed, but he said, not to be here, but he said, Cabinet responsibilities preclude me being able to appear in person, but I want to emphasize how much we as a government are looking forward to reading the big ideas which emanate from this process. The strong ideas and clarity of purpose we have come to expect from the Centre for Social Justice will be greatly welcome in addressing the root causes of poverty. We have to have a greater ambition for people than simply pushing them over an arbitrary income line in order to tick a box that says relative poverty has been addressed. That was a much needed message from the original Breakthrough Britain report, which continues to have significant contribution to the current policy development in the coalition. The launch of Breakthrough Britain 2 is no less timely given that we are just about to celebrate the 70th anniversary of William Beveridge's report, published in December 1942. I welcome the CSJ's ambitions that the recommendations of the Breakthrough Britain 2 process will guide the government going forward and be as equal to defining as those of Beveridge. Recent times have shown us that economic renewal without social progress simply stores up problems for the future. But tackling the five pathways to poverty, if you like, the giants for this 21st century, and dealing with their root causes will lay strong foundations for a brighter future for Britain. There is real anticipation for this work. Um, I'm really delighted now to hand over to each of the chairmen who will bring their areas to life, tell us a bit about the topics we're going to be wrestling with over the next few um, months. And I think we want to invite you to engage with us now. So hear what they have to say, make a note of some of the themes. If you've got contributions to make and things to add to our process, we want to hear from you. We are spending the next 18 months all over the UK. We are listening. We are wanting to learn from people who know what would make a difference in these communities. To start with, I'm going to hand over to Avril McIntyre, who is going to be leading our work on family breakdown. Avril has been chief executive of Lifeline, which is a fantastic organisation, um, really inspirational since she founded it in 2000. Um, and during this time, has developed a suite of services which engage some of the hardest to reach communities across East London. Avril's done a huge amount beyond that, um, but I won't um, read all of your bio. Um, family for us has been a really um, important Point and a big battle. You know, it's probably the most controversial thing we publish about at the CSJ, but we are passionate about the importance of family stability as a poverty fighting tool. So, Avril, um, we're delighted to have you on board. Thank you for agreeing to be a part of the process. And uh, Avril will now speak for about five minutes about what we're doing in the next 18 minutes in the family. Thank you. Reflect the cost and the scale of the problem 
we can see change. And so in the light of this, the working party, working group, will be examining the issues raised in the Breakthrough Britain report originally, but going into greater depth in three key areas. The first one is to really understand the national picture of family breakdown. I mentioned earlier the concerning statistics for children whose parents are split up around poverty and the increase of that and performance in schools and depression or addiction. But we're going to explore the evidence to understand the real impact of these things on the public purse and what interventions can reduce the likelihood of breakdown in the first place or where breakdown does occur, what we can ensure that there's improved outcomes for those families and those children. The second area is the impact of fathers on the child's life. We want to be addressing how we reduce barriers to ensure fathers remain involved after the breakdown in families and actually more importantly that fathers and indeed we as British society recognise the unique and critical role they have to play and that probably needs to start in the antenatal clinics. And the third area we're looking at is the most complex families with those multiple agency interventions. There's been a lot of headlines on this over the last few months. And maybe we need to get beneath the headlines and really understand how we prevent this escalation. And also seek to find effective interventions that prevent the cycles from repeating generation after generation. So in conclusion, we don't yet believe the government's efforts to address family breakdown quite reflect the scale and the cost of the problem. It's an issue that actually touches us all and sometimes for us then it's hard to look at. But the impact of the most disadvantaged communities really is very alarming. We don't want to sit back and watch the inevitable decline, as I said earlier. Recognising the scale and the cost of family breakdown in the UK is the first step to putting measures and messages in place to turn things around. And those messages need to be made in schools, in the courts, to the taxman, and in the GP surgery. Through the Family Breakdown Volume, Breakthrough Britain 2, we will seek to offer an accurate picture in the UK today, some realistic solutions and examples of evidence-based interventions that are working and can be replicated. Thank you. Admiral, thank you. We'll, we'll have plenty of time for questions about um, the nature of um, what the chairman is sharing in a, a bit later, but um, I'm going to hand over now to Alex. Alex Burghardt is not Sir Robin Bosch, um who is leading our work on education. Sir Robin yeah, has a terrific uh, track record. He's director of primary education for the Harris um, Federation and has been head teacher for 22 years and has turned around a number of failing schools. And Sir Robin um, is excited about the process but just can't be here today because I think something's happening at one of his academies. Um, but Alex is a hugely important background um, in education and uh, education policy. He's our Director of Policy too at the CSJ. So Alex will speak now for about five minutes and tell you something of what we're trying to do in this volume on educational failure um, and uh, try and paint a picture about why we think it matters. Uh, thanks, Christian. Um, Sir Robin, he does send his apologies. Uh, he, uh, uh, as Christian says, he has an extraordinary track record of turning around uh, failing schools in some of the poorest parts of London. And uh, today, uh, Ofsted has appeared at uh, one of his primary schools, so um, he's, uh, he's understandably chosen to be there. Um, education lies uh, very close at the heart of what we believe in at CSJ. Um, because education has the power to transform, um, the power to offer new opportunities, the power to help children shrug off the disadvantages that life has heaped upon them. And this is, as you will know, a very exciting time for education. Uh, the sector is currently experiencing some of the most dramatic reforms that it's witnessed since the 1940s. The huge increase in the number of academies. Uh, the end to bureaucratic overload from central government. The creation of a pupil premium to make sure that additional money goes to pupils who have uh, come from the poorest backgrounds. Um, a fresh emphasis on discipline and rigour in schools and the opportunities for charities, teachers, and parents to open their own schools. These are reforms which, broadly speaking, we strongly agree with, and not just because we recommended them in 2007, um, but because they are the first 
vital steps to making sure that everyone, every young person, gets the opportunities that they deserve at school, particularly the poorest children. As you all know, the pressures of financial poverty uh, can and often do drive educational failure. If you're eligible for free school meals, you are five times more likely to fail at school than your peers. But financial poverty is not the only driver to educational failure. Yet, if um, of the 236,000 pupils that finished their GCSEs last year without uh, hitting the floor target, without getting 5A star to C, nearly 80% of those children were not on free school meals. Income is not the only factor here. We desperately want to close the gap between the richest and the poorest. But we must also ask what the prospects are like for the one in five children who leave school having failed both English and Maths GCSE. We have to ask what the outlook is for the next generation when there are still over 2,000 secondary schools where one in 10 children doesn't pass a single GCSE. When there are still schools where more than 30% of the pupils are classed as persistent absentees. Because we know that educational failure can lead to poverty. Indeed, we would argue that to a certain extent, educational failure is poverty. Two thirds of employers believe that schools don't equip young people with the practical skills they need for employment. Nearly three quarters of young offenders would classify their academic achievements as nil. And well over half the prison population uh, has lacks even basic literacy. Education can and does make a difference. You only need to look at schools like Burlington Danes on the White City Estate in London, um, headed, headed by Sally Coates, who we're very pleased to say is on our working group, where almost all of the pupils now go on to higher education, despite the fact that more than 50% of the school is eligible for free school meals. It's examples like these, and examples like others found and represented by the expertise on our working group uh, that have focused our attention to Breakthrough Britain too. All the academic research shows that the most important factor in determining how well children do at school is the quality of teaching. Some of you might say, ask why we needed academic research to tell us that. But that's why we'll be asking what can be done to improve the quality of teaching in those schools and parts of the country where reform has yet to reach. Uh, we'll also be looking at transitions within education. And more can be done, more can be done to ensure that you know, those young children uh, who start school at the age of four, uh, many cases uh, in nappies, um, many cases unable to speak, how those children can be found earlier by the system, how we can make sure that more of them are school ready, how we can close that gap, try and close that gap before it begins. How more can be done to help children make that difficult transition from primary to secondary school, a transition that we know at the moment uh, sees to the undoing of a lot of good work that's been done at primary. And perhaps most importantly of all, um, how we can help young people make the transition from secondary school to work. The majority of children in the education system still don't go to university, and yet for the past 30 years the education system has been squarely based around uh, judging to secondary schools on how many children they are getting in to uh, higher education. We need to look at the majority who are going to go into work and how we can help them get there. And because this is the CSJ, we also want to look beyond confines of the school gates. Often when children fail badly at school, it's not a mere sign of naughtiness uh, or disinterest. It's a sign that something isn't right at home. So we'll be asking what more can be done to help families help their children? What can be done to provide that wraparound care with vulnerable families that might sometimes involve educating parents as well as children. This is an extremely exciting piece of work and uh, as Christian said, we'd really like it if you were all involved with them as well. So uh, please feel free to come uh, forward and uh, make submissions to the working group. Thanks very much. Alex, thank you very much. Um, I'd be delighted now to hand over to um, Baroness Stephen Scott, uh, or Debbie, as um, I'm allowed to call her Debbie. Uh, Debbie's been a tremendous friend to the CHJ, has been involved in 
um, everything we've done really in terms of welfare, economic dependency, and I'm so pleased that Debbie has agreed to chair this process for us. Thank you so much, and we're um, pleased to uh, take, take to the stage. We're delighted to have you with us and look forward to hearing what you have to say.
The universal credit will do much to rectify this, but it will not be the whole answer. And the other thing we want to do is we want to look at when somebody gets a job, when we die and go to heaven, we think it's marvellous. But when they've got that job, how can we help them progress uh, in work? And then, of course, we're going to look at the informal economy. We can make no statements, no judgments about this, but we want to understand what it is. What does it mean to people? What does it mean to employers? And we want to see what the role of the universal credit is going to mean to those involved in the informal economy. And I'm thrilled that we've got Maeve McGoldrick from Community Links helping us. One of the other things we're going to uh, look at is the commissioning model. Um, you know, it's all very well uh, us thinking that we can come up with social impact bonds and social finance, but there is a, there is a gap in the commissioning standards and, and models that exist at the moment, and we want to make sure that we're in the best possible place to enable those who can do the best job to play their full role. So as I said, our group is energised. We're looking forward to producing our report. And if there's anybody here that's sitting on a real good answer, a real silver bullet, then we are the team for you to share with us. So thank you very much. <laughs>
burden or have had arrears of three months or more. Now, personal debt is obviously always with us, um, but as well as increasing generally, debt nowadays is starting to wear a new face. Uh, step change, which was until recently at the CCCS, tells us that they are dealing with a lot more older people <coughs> who are in debt, many of them carrying interest only mortgages, uh, which they have no means of paying off, or find themselves in debt in other ways. And many who would have been considered as being part of comfortable Britain in the past, who have been very much on the edge and vulnerable to falling into debt, um, are now finding that as a result of changes in their circumstances, redundancy, ill health, relationship breakdown, tip them over into serious indebtedness. But, to adapt a phrase that uh, my former uh, colleague, Frank Field, much loved, debt, like unemployment, doesn't fall by God's gentle rain uh, on the population evenly. It strikes from below, and it has its most devastating effects on those with whom Breakthrough Britain too is the most concerned, the poorest and the most disadvantaged. Now the working group that uh, I'm chairing on serious personal debt will bring together a thorough analysis of the scale and nature of Britain's personal debt problem, especially as it affects that most disadvantaged group. And we'll harvest the latest evidence and statistics, listening both to the experts and to those who are directly affected. We'll look at the financial products which uh, might be available either now or potentially in the future to those most financially excluded to see whether they actually make matters worse or whether uh, they can have the potential to provide an alternative of sustainable credit. We'll be examining the role of mainstream and high cost lenders and of alternatives such as credit unions and social enterprise lending. And we will turn the spotlight on the illegal lenders and loan sharks. One low-income household in 20 who have been refused credit have turned to the illegal loan sharks. And illegal money lenders supply as many as 6% of households in our most deprived communities. So we'll be just considering how we can improve people's resilience against debt by increasing their financial capability. Now in this endeavour I'm joined by a distinguished group of experts. We've got Mark, Martin Kopak from FSA, Sharon Collar from Bristol University, John Elson, who runs the Money Advice Trust, the National Deadline, Phil Holdsworth from Christians Against Poverty, Nicola Hughes from Shelter, Damon Gibbons from the Centre for Responsible Credit, and Claire Wiley from the Financial Services Consumer Panel. And all of us are being kept in order by Mark Duncan from the Centre for Social Justice to make sure, I must be like hurting cats, Mark, to <laughs> keep us on the straight and narrow. Now, what's been described as the worst downturn uh, since before the 1930s, even worse than the 1930s, with 1,400 people being made redundant every day, it's not surprising that we should face a tsunami of serious personal debt. But we also need to ensure that public policy, those measures intended to address poverty and worklessness, don't inadvertently push some of those that seek to help further into debt. Universal credit, which I absolutely support, uh, as a principle, has the potential to help hundreds of thousands of people into employment and out of poverty. But unless people are equipped to cope with that shift in budgeting from weekly or fortnightly payments to monthly payments, many could slip into debt. Housing benefit reform, which I had a hand in the beginning when I was at DWP and which is now uh, moving into the next stage in the social sector, can also mean that people who instead of having their rent paid direct to landlords receive it as cash themselves, unless they have the budgeting skills, could find themselves in difficulty. And so we as a group will be looking at ways in which we can make sure that those reform measures in welfare really do achieve their objectives and that we find ways of ensuring that they don't push people further into debt. So you'll have seen, uh, Christian, there's a lot of synergy between the different working groups already. Uh, debt damages family relationships, it undermines educational potential, it reduces psychological and emotional well-being, and it prevents people participating as active citizens as Debbie and her team would like to help them to do. So I want to thank CSJ for um, going through the process of Breakthrough Britain too. Um, thank them for involving us in this. 
and I'm looking forward to working with the other working groups and especially to hearing from all of you the ideas you have got for making sure that still further people's lives are not destroyed by unsustainable debt. Thanks very much. Chris, thank you, and um, such a topical, topical, um, topical for us. Uh, delighted now that there is Noreen um, Oliver. Uh, Noreen is one of those people that you meet every now and again who sort of really whips you up into some sort of um, determination to do something about anything. So um, I think we'll be a great chair of the group. And um, Noreen runs uh, an addiction rehabilitation centre up in Staffordshire. Tremendous track record of getting people into a second chance um, and moving them off substance abuse. Noreen, thanks for chairing this. Um, Noreen also, of course, advises the Interministerial Group on Drugs, which is one of the worst named organisations in Westminster. Um, I assume it's the Interministerial Group about drugs, rather than on drugs. But, um, anyway, <laughs> might explain a few things if they are on drugs. Over to you, Noreen. Thank you very much, um, and thank you, Christian, for um, asking me to chair um, such an important group as the um, Addictions Working Group um, on a subject that is very, very close to my heart from being a receiver of treatment services to today, um, 19 years later, providing treatment services. I am absolutely humbled um, and honoured <coughs> to be chairing a group of such passionate individuals who come with a wealth of experience from across the sector, bottom up, from service user perspective, right through to providers, academics, and politicians sitting all around the table, debating a subject that cuts across every single agenda. Drug and alcohol misuse does not just affect individuals, it affects families and communities. Addiction is a major pathway to poverty and social breakdown. It cuts across every aspect of our society and all of us feel the impact. That is why the addictions work of the Centre for Social Justice is crucial. We are committed to tackling the underlying causes of addiction we hope that our work will help to support, advise and inform local areas as we move into local commissioning and local decision making. To drive forward a truly recovery orientated system, enabling local areas to create genuine opportunities for problem drug users to recover from dependence and make a positive contribution to our society. We are particularly keen to work with um, local partnerships, to work with Public Health England, to work across with the new GP commissioning, to work with our new prime, um, police and crime commissioners, to identify the potential, their potential, to develop recovery-focused alcohol programmes as well. For too long we have failed to acknowledge the harms that are caused by alcohol issues leaving many areas without any significant alcohol provision. And we are committed to driving forward. And also reminding government, as we've heard a lot about families today, of its pledge to work with families to develop and strengthen families and family breakdown, to tackle family breakdown, particularly those that are suffering the impact of addiction right across the sector. I want us to quote something so as you can get a feel um, of how drug addiction cuts across every agenda and the difference <coughs> that it will make to all of us in this society if we start to make changes, if we start to tackle head on the causes, the underlying causes of addiction. The Home Office strategy, drug strategy of 2010, clearly states, and I quote, approximately 400,000 benefit claimants, around 8% of all working age benefit claimants in England are dependent on drugs or alcohol, generating benefit costs of 1.6 billion a year. 
If these individuals are supported to recover and contribute to society, the change is huge. Yet, this is not the only area where the change is going to have a far-reaching impact. And I'm sure for many of us, automatically, when we talk about drug or alcohol misuse, automatically you will think about crime and you will think about our NHS and our um, health services. But if you look at it as a whole and how it cuts across all of the agendas, all of my colleagues' area of work, um, you will see that there are many, many more. But what is also immeasurable is actually the difference that it will make to families and our communities. And in some of those areas, we cannot manage that, measure that, but we can certainly feel it. We can feel it every day when we go home and we close our door and we feel safe that there isn't antisocial behaviour on the corner. When we're walking down the street, you know, that we're not hanging on to our handbags or it's dark walking through a park that we are going to be mugged. You know, and that is the reality and that is the difference by tackling substance misuse that it will make to every single one of us and breaking the cycle for future generations, breaking the cycle in families and communities. The Addictions Working Group are united in purpose for a better treatment system and rigorous in its assessment of the evidence. So, if any of you have anything that you would like to contribute, if you think there are any particular areas that you feel we should be looking at, or if we should be coming out to you um, and visiting you, then we would like to hear your comments. Um, we are very open, you know, and if we're going to make a difference, let's make a difference together. <coughs> and let's actually identify the areas by tackling this massive, massive challenge, which is a very ambitious challenge, but we're determined and we're passionate and we are determined we will get there. But we need to work together in order to deliver that and to drive it through. It doesn't just affect me as a receiver or a provider. It affects every single one of you in the room and it affects your children and it affects your community. So you know, let's make a determined effort to tackle this subject together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Noreen. Uh, and uh, last but obviously not the least, um, you've heard from the five chairmen who are looking at the big themes and the things that we've identified at the CSJ as being some of the things that push people into poverty and that hold communities back. I mentioned earlier that there's, that there's a sixth area to this process, which is about unlocking the potential and the brilliance of the voluntary sector or the social sector, including social enterprises and all of, all of the people involved in that. Uh, Danny Kruger is sharing that work. Danny runs a, a creative arts company called Only Connect. And before uh, running that, he was um, director of studies at the Centre for Policy Studies. He was a chief leader writer of the Daily Telegraph and was a speech, speech writer to Daily Cameron until 2008. He decided to leave politics and go and work for Only Connect full time. Danny, it's, it is so good to have you involved in this process, and thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Christian. Thank you. And, um, Yes, thanks for, uh, for having me do, do this work. I'm hugely impressed by what I've been hearing there and uh, hugely impressed and slightly overawed by the scale of this challenge of our group has because, uh, <coughs> to my mind at least, the uh, voluntary sector or the social sector, as uh, I insist on calling it, um, is, is as a huge part of the answer to the problems that we've been listening to. Uh, and the sense that we're getting in the work we've been doing so far is that this is the best of times and the worst of times uh, for the social sector. Uh, it's the best of times partly because we've got a government which, uh, we've probably never had a government which has been more philosophically committed to the work of, uh, of, of charities and other social organisations. Uh, and was put more rhetorical and uh, policy momentum behind uh, behind the sector. Uh, there is also, I think, more uh, widely a uh, sense in the country that the old model of centralised statutory provision to response to social problems uh, is kind of on its course, is intellectually exhausted, practically. Um, 
possible. So, so the, the, there, are, there are reasons to be cheerful from that point of view. Uh, however, what we're hearing, of course, and what we see, what we experience, uh, is that this is an incredibly tough time to be working in this sector and to be trying to deliver work uh, for uh, some of the poorest communities as an independent organisation. And I experience this as a, running a, in a small charity with uh, less than a million pounds. And we are in a place which uh, is pretty uncomfortable. We're on the, on the journey, we hope, uh, from being a small scale, uh, you know, little one man band, two man band, in the case of our charity set up with my wife six years ago with you know, our, our little savings as a start up, and that's it. And, uh, and we're trying to get to the stage um, where we are sustainable and receiving ongoing funding from statutory and private sources which make us make us you know, properly founded as an organisation. We are, it feels like we are crossing a desert strewn with the bones of charities which have gone before trying to get from uh, small to big from that uh, low level scale which it is possible to survive on voluntary contributions, on, on, on pro bono health and friends and family uh, working on, on a small scale, vitally important as that work is, uh, to get to the stage where uh, where there are large scale contracts uh, and an element of professionalism, frankly, in one's operations. So it's a very difficult stage to be in. And to, to our mind, that middle uh, sort of stage of, of the sector is actually the lifeblood um, of the sector and of, of, of communities more generally. And if charities, social organisations, social enterprises can't operate at that mid scale and can't make the journey from small to big, We've got a huge problem uh, ahead of us. There's an attenuation of the sector going on between uh, it's stretching out where there's a concentration of very small, and very large charities, and not enough of that middle ground. So that is a problem we're, we're observing. Related to it, <coughs> undoubtedly, and this is another uh, down, as uh, the part of the downside of life at the moment, uh, is the uh, not just the public sector spending squeeze, which we are familiar with, but the reduction in private giving, which is hitting charities very hard. And there was a report out in the last month showing that there's been a 20% reduction in individual donations to charities over the last year, down from 11 billion to 9 billion. Uh, and of course, remember that a large part of that total is goes to medical uh, charities, research charities. Uh, the funding available for the small poverty fighting organisations, which the CSJ is concerned with, is shrinking. So what we're doing as a group is looking Across, uh, across the piece in this initial diagnostic stage of the work. Looking first at commissioning, at the uh, way that the public sector has out uh, contracts, and uh, do they properly value the sector? Do they understand the particular needs and opportunities presented by social organisations in delivering public services for public goods? How, how is the interface between commissioners and the sector going? Does payment by results offer a way through and an opportunity? Certainly it does. What about the need for working capital to get the work going for a small outfit like us? Following on from that, social investment, does that offer the answer to that issue of upfront funding for payment by results contracts? There is a huge amount of excitement right now around kind of hybrid finance models and getting private capital involved with uh, public services. I find it all very exciting. But as a, uh, a witness who came to us the other week uh, to our working group said, rather risque uh, uh, analogy, says social finance is like sex at school. Hardly anybody's doing it. Everybody's talking about it, and nobody's doing it very well. <laughs> um, uh, and, and it does kind of feel like that. It's a very exciting area, but it's not happening a lot. And there are indications that the world is going on in that field. It's got problems. Um, that actually does prompt a question for us, uh, which you know, should we actually be encouraging school students to have sex, as it were? Um, you know, should, should charities, uh, social projects, be involved in these complicated finance uh, instruments? Should we be engaging in the corporate sector uh, in that way? And if we do so, how do we protect what might be regarded as the essential value of the social sector, which is uh, the, the heart of it, the sacrificial element, the fact that people are doing it? not for themselves, not for profit, uh, but for, for their recipients. And so lastly, we want to look at <coughs> social action, the role of communities themselves in, uh, in this work, the place that values have in, uh, in, in, in this work. 
And I would just note on that point, another reason to be cheerful at the moment is the new uh, and very demonstrable openness to the faith sector in the provision of public services and public goods. Now, lastly, just to, just to wrap up, for, for me, ultimately, I am optimistic. I think that the voluntary sector, the social sector, does offer a huge amount of um, uh, opportunities, and there are opportunities for us. And principally, that is because we offer what I think was a strength-based vision of social change. You know, we are not fixated on problems and needs and failures in the way that the statutory sector has to be. We are concerned not to reduce official statistics, statistics of social breakdown. We believe in the people that we're working for, and we are concerned, yes, to address their needs, but because we actually believe in them and believe in the contribution that they can make. And I was very touched by Norway's point about the contribution that addicts, uh, you know, benefit from addicts, we can actually make to our society, not simply by reducing the costs of social failures, taking those about welfare, um, but uh, by the contribution that they can make to their communities. And uh, I am, I'm, I'm personally hugely excited and honoured to be doing this work. James Mumford, who's the researcher, um, uh, is as well. And the, the two of us have, feel like this is potentially, um, with respect, uh, the, 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 most, the most exciting thing that, uh, that the whole report could be doing because uh, it, it, it promises, I think, a revolution in the way that, that, that we, we address public goods and will fulfil uh, Beveridge's second, famous second volume of this report, which came out subsequent to the, um, to the one that concerned the five giants, the great problems, uh, we are concerned about um, finding these solutions and uh, emphasizing preventative rather than, rather than curative uh, dimension of the work. So, um, thank you very much for, 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 for having me do this work. Um, we've got a brilliant, brilliant team, see some of them, uh, some of the working group of people sitting here. We'd love to get more James and I around, and um, please do, uh, please do chip in. Thank you.